Scout Week is a nonprofit 501c3 created in Los Angeles, the entertainment capital of the world. Scout Week's mission is to celebrate and perpetuate the very special relationship between Scotland and the United States, as well as modern Scottish culture combined with traditional Scottish history. Scout Week was created to shine a spotlight on Scottish contributions not only in the U.S., but throughout the globe by highlighting Scotland's rich history of art, music, film and television, business and innovation, travel, food, and drink. As a charity, Scout Week provides educational and internship opportunities through our partnerships with the Scottish Business Network, Entrepreneurial Scotland, and the Saltier Foundation, all with the support of the Scottish Government. In this series, we'll go behind the scenes of entertainment and industry as we interview our favorite members of the Scottish community. Get a first-hand look at the cultural contributions of the Scottish diaspora and travel with us around the world on an exciting journey to experience all things Scottish. Hi, I'm Cindy McIntosh. And I'm Kelsey Deere. And this is Scott Week. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining Scott Week um, for the Scottish International Week in Edinburgh and partnering with the Scottish Business Network. We are so excited to have you on today. We have a very special panel of guests. Kelsey? Yes, hi, thank you so much for tuning in to explore and listen to our Scots in LA panel. And today we have Ian Wright, Gavin Quirk, Daniel B, and Ross King, MBE. <laughs> so, uh, thank you all so much for being here. We are so excited, so thrilled to have you participate. Um, so with that, um, I'm just going to have you guys go around and introduce yourselves. And don't be shy. I know you Scots don't like to put yourselves in the limelight. Maybe Ross does, but <laughs> we ignore you. Um, so Ian Wright, do you want to go first? Oh, gee, thanks, Kelsey. <laughs> I, so I'm... Born in Glasgow, or just outside Glasgow in Barrhead, or as we would say, Borheed. Um, <laughs> lived my first three years in the Gorbals, when it really was the Gorbals, and then moved out to the housing estates in the suburbs. Uh, educated as a biologist, biochemist, at what now is very poshly called the University of the West of Scotland, but was Paisley College of Technology when I was there. Uh, I got my big break, I guess, when with absolutely zero experience, I was given the chance to set up a brand new lab to study infection premature babies at the St. Mary's Hospital Medical School in London. My first lab was directly above the windowsill where Fleming discovered penicillin. So that was always a thrill every time I looked out the window. Um, <laughs> I then decided academia was not for me, jumped ship and went to industry. I've been in biotechnology for 30 years working in pharmaceuticals, diagnostics, ended up working for a company called Siemens in Germany, um, where I headed up their global innovation for their healthcare organization and their um, test development R&D groups. Um, I retired 2012 and now sit on company boards, advisory boards, uh, charitable institutions, and uh, you know, I just love music and photography just now, so I have a lot of time to do that. Thank you, Ian. Um, Gavin, how about you? Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Gavin Quirk. Uh, I'm also from Glasgow, from the south side in, in Newton Mearns. Uh, I was educated in Scotland as well. Went to the University of Strathclyde where I studied business. And then once I got my degree, I moved down to London. Started my career with the Agio, the drinks company. Spent four years there before making the change into Disney, into the, the studio side of the business. Spent about another eight years at Disney in London before moving to LA about 10 years ago with uh, Disney. And then after I left Disney, I joined Netflix two years ago, where I currently head up the fulfillment operations team, which is responsible for basically getting all our assets product ready. So all the video, the subs, the dubs, the artwork, the trailer. So it comes through my team and we get them distributed and ready to go around the world to, to please our members. So yeah, nice to meet you all. And I'm excited about the panel today. And Daniel, would you like to introduce yourself? 
Um, gosh, how can I follow either of those two excellent starts there? Um, hello, I'm Ross King, MBE. Um, oh, no, that, that, that doesn't work. I'm, I'm, I'm clearly here as the sort of minority ticket because I'm from the east coast of Scotland, um, born and raised in Edinburgh. Uh, stayed there till I was 24 after working in architecture and working in law and running off to the circus. Moved to London into publicity, um, went straight into sort of PR career working in film, entertainment, theatre, musical theatre, and, and looking after sort of famous people for want of a better word and, and always had relationships in LA and, and New York as well but decided to come to uh, LA to have a little look at the entertainment industry here and got here 10 years ago. Um, so publicist but also brand consultant and I also seem to run some hotels in Morocco but that's just, that's just the I wild card. That as you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just in my spare time. Um, <laughs> Love you. Oh, thank you very much. Worked in law and entertainment. Oh, and ran after the circus. And then da 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 da. I think portfolio career is probably the correct um, term. And I didn't get the memo about the blue shirt as well. So I feel a bit like <laughs> I've, let, I've let us all down again. Oh, no. <laughs> and Ross, how about you? Uh, well, thank you for letting me follow Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> because I was, I was going to say, when he see was, I was going, oh, mommy, daddy, mommy, daddy, mommy, daddy. How do I follow these things? <laughs> But Daniel, it's all right. Uh, <laughs> um, Ross King, a TV host, actor, producer, writer, uh, finest in his price range, as I always like to say. Um, yeah, started off by, born in Glasgow, um, in Scotston, um, in a council house. Moved to Knightswood, very posh, in a council house. <laughs> and uh, started my career really in hospital radio. I mean, at school, I was still doing all the, the silly stuff and the acting and the singing and the, and the DJing at the school uh, stuff. And then I joined Radio Clyde, which was Scotland's biggest commercial radio station, which, funnily enough, when I was 16, I worked with Gavin's dad, Norman, um, going back all those years ago when dinosaurs roamed the world. So that was a great time <laughs> when they used to listen to the music. Um, <laughs> and um, went into TV when I was very young and more acting and then moved to London. Uh, Again, very young when I was in my so just early twenties, and then been lucky to have worked TV, theater, film, West End musicals, a whole silly batch of stuff. Written a couple of books, and um, and then moved here in two thousand, right at the millennium, and uh, came out in that classic way for pilot season, and then never left. Never, never booked a pilot, but, <laughs> but, never, but never left. So maybe that is the trick: do not book a pilot, but just stay and keep trying. Um, so that's it, and here I am. And but maybe you didn't book a pilot, but you did win, win an Emmy. <laughs> oh, uh, four, four actually. So. Exactly. <laughs> no, no, don't book a well, pilot. I won them. I did win them in an auction on eBay. I think you have to <laughs> add in the the extra bit news Emmys on eBay. Uh, so yeah, no, I was very lucky. I, I moved out here, and then I did some acting, and then. I uh, worked at KTLA as their, uh, initially I did the weather for them as well. And then I was their entertainment anchor uh, and news at 10 for about six years. And then moved over to Good Morning Britain. Well, actually we were GMB, uh, we were GMTV, then we were Daybreak, then we were Good Morning Britain. And also through that Lorraine Kelly show as well. So yeah, and then I did a show here called The World's Best for CBS last year. So yeah, there we are. It's easy. Amazing. And so you talked a little bit about how you came and, and you wind up staying. And we hear that from so many of our mutual friends. But what did keep all of you here um, besides the beautiful sunshine? Do you want, shall I try and answer this one possibly on behalf of us all? Yes. And, and actually, sunshine is really important because I grew up in darkness for the first 24 years of my life and then moved to London and thought it was tropical. Mm -hmm. um, in, in LA, you do wake up every day and you think, okay, I've got a chance to do something today because it's nice because at least I can go outside and it makes a difference. And if you don't, again, stop me at any point, but it does make a difference when you are surrounded by positivity. I'm not going to go all sort of Venice Beach and woo-woo, but I mean, certainly I was always taught the sort of religious thing where you were, I shall not, must not, should not, could not, mustn't. And if you hear that every day, cannot, shouldn't, mustn't. It's kind of negative. And, and I know I, my love for Scotland is huge, but that's quite draining on you. You come here and it's probably, again, the diametric opposite. 
So you've got better weather, you've got better positivity. Plus also, I think you can reinvent or augment or, <laughs> yeah, um, or do different things here in a way there's opportunity. And, and I hope, I mean, guys, add anything into that, but I just wanted to get that done relatively quickly. Yeah, I mean, I, I would tend to agree with that. I mean, you know, when I first came over here, it was for professional reasons. You know, I was working in entertainment. This is the epicenter of entertainment. So it was a great career progression to, to come here. I always thought if I moved to America, it would be New York because New York and London were so similar. And that's kind of where I felt more at home. But when I came here, yeah, I mean, the weather's fantastic. I've still got that Scottish mentality of my mum in my head saying, it's sunny, get outside and do something. And it's sunny every day. So I get exhausted. I, mean, I'm, I feel so bad sitting in watching TV, but... Yeah, I mean, the weather helps, the positivity helps. You know, I've, I've got a great life here. I've made a great bunch of friends. So, yeah, I mean, the job brought me here, but it's all the additional benefits to keep me here for sure. I, when you, I, I, the only thing I would add to that is I was, I'd actually been working here before I moved here. I had an R&D group out here um, who reported to me, but I think there's a difference. In a, maybe it's a West Coast thing generally, but there's a willingness to try things here. There's... I think in Scotland, sometimes there's a fear of failing and, and looking stupid. Uh, so people maybe don't always try. Um, I think here people are willing to try things. If it doesn't work, you know what? doesn't matter. There's tomorrow and we'll try something else. Uh, and, and that's pretty uh, enlightening and, and gives you lots of opportunities. Amazing. And um, Ross, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think basically what all the boys have said is so, so true. Um, you know, that we all obviously adore our home country and love it and it will always be home. Um, but there certainly is, you know, it is Daniel was saying at the beginning there, there is a little bit of the, you know, we, we have also, you know, that, well, I can't, Kent his father is a great Scottish expression. And, and, and in fact, I did know Gavin's dad. Um, but th there is that, that thing of that. I think here, if you, and I also, I think Daniel, you hit the nail on the head when you said it can be the complete opposite here. You know, in, in Glasgow, if you were to say, I'm going to be a writer, people like, I, of course you are. <laughs> no. And where I see it, people go, oh, well, that's brilliant. And oh, what have you written? Or are you writing at the moment? There's, a, there's definitely an encouragement here. And I, d I don't think people in Scotland are being discouraging as such. It's more like a reality check. And it's the way that we're all brought up. And as Kelsey, as you said at the beginning, we're not particularly good at promoting ourselves. And I think, you know, as, as a nation, we look to Ireland slightly jealously, jealously in the way that, you know, they've created... Irish pubs and the crack and all the rest of it. And it's not really any different to Scotland, but they managed to do it. Whereas we're a bit more reserved. Um, and, and also, I think that's a really lovely thing as well, but it's, it's interesting how you, you sometimes have to slightly break out of that a little bit, um, which is not easy for, for most Scots to do, but you, you have to try and do it. And again, you have to sometimes come to another country to, to let that flourish. Absolutely. And speaking of flourishing, uh, I know, I think all of you mentioned the sun. So should we do a tan contest? Does anybody have a winner <laughs> for having the best tan? I know, Ross, you have a pool. And it's um, <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. I must, I, I, better, I better tell, I, I'm actually Scottish Italian, so I've already got a little bit of the, a little bit of well, the olive cheating. oil. That's exactly. 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 Not so I'm, I'm exempting myself from that. <laughs> uh, but, but, I'm, but, I, but I still go from blue to white. Yeah. I'm afraid I'm suffering from a pandemic at the moment. So. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I'll add in from pink to white to pale blue. That's basically my, that's my color <laughs> reference. That's all I've got. Um, it's funny when you were saying there, Gavin, about, you know, what your mom said, and I was just thinking about that as well, that uh, all the things that she always told you not to do or to do. So I, I do remember right here one time when my mom was here and actually having a big lunch, and then running outside, jumping into the swimming pool, having had a full lunch, and getting out with my hair wet, and then picking up a pair of scissors and running with scissors. It was just the most freeing moment. I was outside with my hair wet, I was running with a full stomach, and running with scissors. Did you put your finger in like a plug socket as well, just to get the full, the full set? <laughs> you guys are all in, it's kind of funny, all you guys are in different uh, industries and professions, but they're all interlinked in some way. Um, I mean, Ian, I know that you're from biotech, but you have your amazing photography and you're surrounded by musical instruments right now. And I know your love for music. Um, 
But leading into that, what professional challenges have you faced in LA, in particular as a Scot? Absolutely none. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I talked a little bit about the willingness to try things. I, the real reason I first came here was I was asked to come as a consultant at Cedar sinai and help them set up some new laboratories. And, you know, the Cedar sinai is a little bit like the whole of LA. They were willing to try new things. They didn't have the old models of academia and this is the way things must be done. So we're willing to try new things and I have no challenges at all, only opportunities here. I've, I, I think it's a fantastic place to do business. Um, Ross, what professional challenges have you had? I, the need to be taller and more talented. <laughs> I think it's, it's just a simple, simple thing. It was actually funny enough, director Dougie Squires, who was a legendary director in Britain, once said that to me at the end of a, of a scene in a show. And I said, you know, I really want to, you know, learn, please, I take direction. He said, could you be taller and more talented? So, uh, so sadly, I failed in both. <laughs> Since moving here, I thought maybe it would help, but no. Uh, in, in, a, in a major way, I actually agree with, with Ian, I think, so much opportunity here and there hasn't been i mean i th i think there is this weird thing that brits have in general where they all think that americans love our accents and i don't think they particularly do i think they like it but it's not you know i i go back and i hear so many stories of people going and i hear people in shops will just say oh just keep talking to me and all that and occasionally you get that but it's not I mean, there's a lot of British people and they've heard a lot of British accents. So it's not, there's a little bit of a kind of eerie fairiness about that that I've never quite understood. It's a bit like um, I, the, the Glasgow boys will know as well that there's this weird thing you go to London and when English people will try and speak in a Scottish accent and then they'll always go, Gla are you going back to Glasgow? And I think, <laughs> I lived in Glasgow for you know, my formative years. Not once did anyone call Glasgow, Glasgow. I mean, Glasgow, yes, but it's this, this weird thing that is kind of myth has been perpetuated. So there's, but I think also, I mean, I was lucky, especially at KTLA here, I point as if it's just over there, um, <laughs> that, uh, that with my accent, that definitely was a help because it was very different. And even the way that I joined, it was through an audience type thing. So people were voting and things. And I think they themselves would have thought, I'm not sure we can have somebody Scottish as part of the news team or doing the weather or doing the entertainment, but people did react well to it. So I think from that point of view, very lucky. And I also think as well that um, if you have a, a mildish Scottish accent, very easy to understand. You know, I mean, there's obviously certain dialects which are hard to understand even for Scots, but I think in the main that if you, as my dear old dad always gave me the advice, which was speak slower and slower still, and you'll still be speaking quite quickly. But I think that that certainly helps as well. So I, I, again, I'm with Ian. I think it's such a wonderful land of opportunities. And once you, you know, I think once you realize you have to overcome the things, whether it be visas, whether it be getting credit and all the rest of it, but because Scots in the main, we're, we're very tenacious. And I always use that word about people who come here you know, it's the tenacious ones that will achieve because that's what you need. You need to keep going. You need to keep overcoming those obstacles. You need to think, how do I beat the system and all the rest of it? Um, and again, you know, it's interesting when, when you were saying there about, you know, Fleming, you know, you think all these Scots that have gone before it and have done the most amazing things. And, you know, I think... That, Daniel, we always talk about this because you read it off a tea towel, don't you? You know, the whole thing about, you know, you know, the the phone being invented, the tele, you know, the television, then the the Dunlop tires on the Tar Macadam that we you know, and all those things. But it is phenomenal. So I think, you know, we, we're just we're all doing a little bit and following in the these incredible leaders and incredible innovators. Um, and I think that speaks volumes again about Scots. Can I just add, I, I think, Ross, what you said about London was great because I found it much more challenging being a Scot in London yeah. than either here or Germany okay. because there's such a negative stereotype sometimes in London about Scots. Um, it's, it's sometimes more difficult there. Good point. Interesting. Gavin, you were shaking your head too, and I know, Daniel, you've been in London as well. Did you experience that with being a Scot in London versus Los Angeles? 
Well, I, I think in my London experiences, I've always sort of stayed around King's Cross. So it was a sort of a double hit because if you, you know, almost suggest that you didn't even make it out of the train station and you just <laughs> drunk and you just fell forward. And, 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 and I found the English quite tough, as I still do today. Um, there's a, there's a, there is a colonial imperial sort of subservience that we sometimes feel to the sort of gentry of England that I've certainly felt, even though I'm from Edinburgh, where we're meant to be the English of the Scottish. Um, uh, it's, it, England, yeah, it's tough, but, but Americans that I've encountered here have been very open and, and not prejudiced or benefiting from history. Um, or knowledge or geography or any ability to understand what geography is but um and just to answer sort of the next question on there because I, I know before I, i'm super interested to hear what Gunnar has to say about this i found corporate america quite difficult i'm used to being in an office where there's banter there's 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 proper conversation you can tell something you can actually speak very honestly and my experience of america the biggest challenge was being in a corporate setting where you actually have to be so collegiate and listening and open you can't actually speak your opinion and i'd love to know what what, what netflix is like and what disney was like because they are probably the bastions of um corporate living which is kind of scary how, how is it yeah well I mean, that's actually what i was going to say so i mean on all the accent stuff i, I totally agree and i think it can be it, it can be a double-edged sort of course you know people are going to understand you or maybe not but also it can open doors it kind of makes you stand out from the crowd i mean i do remember when i first moved here I went to a restaurant in the Grove. I was booking, I was asking for a table and the waitress said to me, oh, where are you from? I'm like, Scotland, you know, how long have you been in America? I was like, just two months. She went, your English is incredible. <laughs> and I, I was like, you know, we speak English in Scotland. It's just, that might just be a unique situation, but I mean, you always get those barriers. But, but what I would say in terms of professional challenges that I had, and I don't think this is unique to being Scottish, but more coming from the UK education system, whereas, in America, having an MBA is almost a prerequisite to moving into employment, whereas in the UK, it's not as popular. So when I first came here, all my peers had MBAs. So I felt almost like a little bit behind the curve in terms of education, but I did a great relevant experience before coming here, which kind of sort of set me aside. So I think that's the slight difference in terms of education qualifications, both the US versus the UK. But in terms of what Daniel was saying about corporate America, yeah, it's, it's night and day. You know, when I was working in London, we would have like shouting and swearing matches across the entire floor and then it'd be resolved over a pint at the end of the day. Whereas in America, it was like, no, you know, you do, you do not speak like that. You, which is professionalism, but there's a bit, there's a very, very different corporate environment here compared to the UK for sure. Without a doubt. And you have to adapt to that. Do you think some of that's a time thing as well, though the times change? Yeah. I, I mean, I think of Scotland I, or even Britain that's 15 years ago when I worked there. And I'm sure Britain's different from where it is now. So I think uh, the times have changed and we do behave a little bit better maybe than we used to. Well, no, I, I would absolutely agree with that. And even then you're seeing now with uh, sort of these big corporations that now have a lot more of inclusion and diversity in terms of within their executive suite, you know, they have dedicated uh, C-level people looking at this. And that's not something we had when I was working in London either. So yeah, times have absolutely changed without a shadow of a doubt. Thankfully. Uh yeah. And maybe part of it too is the difference between I love watching Parliament and they're yelling and screaming and you know jeering at each other. Congress just isn't like that here either. So maybe there's something, something cultural. Maybe they should be. Maybe yeah, let off some steam and then have a fight at the end of the day. Why the press is more important here because you don't have prime minister's question time. <laughs> it's a job the press have to do here. But they don't. <laughs> the press don't do it and, and you're saying corporately you know, as a publicist it's that really weird thing the differences I felt is in Britain you have sort of what well, we used to have 11 national daily newspapers there is not a national daily newspaper here so you have to start to think very differently and you frame things differently and the, the, the experience you are sometimes lulled into the false sense of security because you have a relatively similar language that you are the same I personally feel that myself and many Americans there is there is no parallel other than language. And that's a bit confusing anyway. So, but I think it's changed as well. Oh. Sorry, I was going to say, and occasionally, and I'm sure we've all witnessed this as well, is, is the humour sometimes. Mm. I mean, sometimes a lot of Americans get the, the Scottish humour. And because at times we, we can be a bit droll and a bit dry. And I, I always think that we, there was a guy that I worked with, funnily enough, at 
Radio Clyde back in the day. And whenever you go into the office and say, you know, where's Johnny or something, he would always say, oh, he went mad. We had to shoot him. And that was, <laughs> it just always made me laugh. And he would say, and you, every, I mean, he probably said it three times a day. And so I occasionally would say that to so somebody who would say to me, you know, oh, where's David? And I go, oh, he went mad. We had to shoot him. And they go, what? Yeah. What? I, <laughs> I, I learned pretty fast as well that the, the, the sense of humor was different. I remember being in Disney and somebody came in in a suit and tie, which was, we always were casual. So I just immediately went, oh, court case died. Job, court, no, court case or job interview. And they just looked at me. I was like, well, it's, okay, sorry. Didn't mean to sort of pry, but yeah, you just have to adapt. And I'm like going back to just like how corporate America, or the world has changed. You know, a lot of these big corporations now, they employ from around the world. You know, we have a lot of employees from all over the world now at Netflix. And you can't just have a sort of a, a UK or US mindset. It has to be a global mindset, which means you have to adapt because, you know, the nature of entertainment now, it's a, it's a, global, it's a global business. And you have to realize that people are working with you from all over the world. Absolutely. And having said that, you know, part of Scott Week's mission is to provide internship and scholarships um, for people to have the opportunity to study abroad. So what, what advice would all of you give to someone, especially a young person who's looking to move here? What was the biggest piece of advice? That you could give? <laughs> Just now, don't do it. <laughs> You'd be mental. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Don't move here. <laughs> well, I mean, no, I mean, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to jump in on that one. I think, I think the world is going through a very difficult time right now. We all know that. We're all feeling it. Okay. Multiplied, by, multiplied by America. And, uh, you know, as we're doing this at the end of September 2020, it's uh, the optics forward, even for the next six months, are kind of difficult. Now, I'm not, we all know this moment's going to pass. We all know presidencies are going to come and go. I would try to be encouraging and say you still come to America and see it and learn and, and, and be taught and, and listen and and possibly I realize now how brilliant Scotland is in comparison to many other places that I've lived and worked and and, and but you only know that once you you sort of look at it uh, in the rear view mirror and um, I would say encouraging they work in any other country I think Scott Week's mission to do that is fantastic but America's kind of tough just now. I'm, I'm not going to talk it down because, again, we all choose to be here, but it's, I've certainly found it really quite challenging in the last few weeks. Yeah, I, mean, I can yeah, understand it's, that it's, yeah. it's the pandemic, but maybe moving forward after, after the pandemic, if things were normalized. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the best bit of advice I would give to anybody coming to America is really twofold. It's one, it's gaining as much experience experience as you can you know, before you come here. Things like internships, as Scott and these kind of things are invaluable. You're gaining relevant work experience in the field you want to be in because as I was mentioning earlier on, I think coming to here straight out of university would be challenging because there is that difference in education and understanding. You know, I went to I went to Strathclyde Uni, which is a highly expect highly respected institution in the UK and Europe. But when you come here, not a lot of people know them. It's getting better now, but we're trying our best to sort of improve that profile. So it's like, how do you break down that barrier? So that was the first thing, get as much experience as you can. And then secondly, just have an open mind because expectation isn't always reality. You know, when I thought I was moving to Hollywood, I was thinking, oh, this is going to be, I'm going to be in the hills, I'm going to be in the parties and Hollywood Boulevard is glamorous. And I mean, Ross will tell you, it's not necessarily like that. And it's, so you've got to be open-minded that your expectation might not meet reality and you've got to be you know, you've got to be flexible enough to adjust to your new reality as it, as it unfolds. I, I think I would say the same advice that I would, especially if you're talking specifically about Los Angeles, that would give anyone moving to London or Berlin and that's make sure you use it. Get out there, use the city to your advantage, get your networks established, go to all the institutional art, cultural things you possibly can don't sit back. It's a beautiful place. The countryside's fantastic. If you're going to sit back in, in your house and this is a strange time, then you might as well be in Kansas. So <laughs> if, if you don't use it, you, you, there's no point in being here. Yeah. And I, th I, I would just reiterate the tenacity word again, because I think that is such a big thing. Uh, and also it'd be interesting to, to hear what, what Ian uh, thinks on this side as well is that I always feel that it's it's America's pitch. Uh, I, I tend to always go to football analogies, so please stop me if it gets ridiculous. But I always think it's America's pitch, and you can play in the game, 
but you, we're not going to change the game completely. And we're not going to, we can't go, go, ah, but our rules are, and this is, you know, you can try, you can help with the coaching a little bit and all the rest of it, but at the end of the day, it's their pitch, their rules, and adapt. And I think that is a little bit like what you were saying, Gavin, isn't it? That you've got to come in, mm. bit of an open mind. And yeah, I mean, you can do your own little stuff, but at the end of the day, I think it's also not being disrespectful to the, the, the country as well. So I want to interject, Cindy, I'm going to have you do the last one, but I just want to interject a quick question to you. I'm just curious. Um, was there a person or a moment or an opportunity when you came to Los Angeles that really helped give you that um, launch over a barrier or something that you need to get over? And I know Ross and Ian, you said, oh, I had no problems whatsoever, but it might have not have been professional. It might have just been hey, I'm new in Los Angeles, I need to make friends, or I want to get into photography or explore doing art or whatever it is. Was there someone or an opportunity that really meant a lot to you when you first came to Los Angeles? Well, I, I remember um, with my partner here, we, we said we'd take the opportunity to learn a foreign language and we both said English. So <laughs> <laughs> having got over that barrier, then that was fine. <laughs> I mean, for me, I, th I think going back to what Ian was saying earlier on about sort of just getting out of there and sort of putting yourself out When I came here, I didn't know anybody. I mean, I knew some people at Disney, but, you know, not, not sort of deeply. So I just like, I, I threw myself into everything. You know, I joined, I joined, there's a Brits in LA group over here and I joined that and I joined, we'd set up a football team and I met all my friends through this football team. And, and having those, that sort of expat community really helped me because it gave you that attachment to home. It gave you like a sort of a social outlet as well to kind of we're all in similar situations. So we're talking about our visa problems or how much we miss home. So just having that community and having that group really helped me settle in, you know, quicker than I might have done if I didn't really know anyone at all. Interestingly enough, I found here that the people that were most helpful were not Brits. I found a lot of Brits here were very much like it's, it was like prison food. It's like, what, what are you right. doing here? What, oh, what are you here for? And, Oh, really? Yeah, no, I don't really know anybody in that. I, I found that definitely a lot that there was just a little bit of like, mm, yeah, you know, it's like yeah. I've built up these contacts. And I'm not going to share them with you or I'm not going to share, my, you know, ideas and what have you. And I, 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 I don't know. I think I was very fortunate with my mum and dad, but I was brought up that, you know, and again, here's my football analogy. You know, the ball's round to go round. Every, you know, everything is is pay it forward and you know pay it forward and not necessarily wanting it to come back or hoping that it will come back it probably does come back at some point but just be helpful and, and i've always said to people whenever they come here whenever i meet them that the one thing that i always offer is obviously help or advice but i always offer them a cup of tea because i always think it's the one thing that a nice wee cup of tea you know if you can go to someone's house and even just sit for a half an hour or an hour or something and then just spill out your feelings of, oh my goodness me, I can't believe this happened or, you know, this casting director said this or they said this or this director or this other actor said this. And sometimes you just want, you want to put your feet up and feel it a wee bit at home and just have a cup of tea and just chat. And that's, that's what I always have felt is the most it's one of the most beneficial things that I think you can have here because the rest of it can be so weird. And as I said, sometimes, you know, Brits in general can be a little bit, you know, hogging on to stuff. Uh, but I did, there, there was a wonderful lady who worked at King World, which has nothing to do with me, sadly. <laughs> um, and it was, the, 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 the funniest thing for me was that I just moved into this apartment and obviously didn't really have much stuff. And, and she's, I was chatting with her and she said, well, what, what do you need? And I said, you know, it's really funny. I said, I really love having a desk because I feel, I don't know whether it's the schoolboy mentality or whatever, but I, I feel that I'm, if I have a desk, I can anchor myself and I can get on with stuff. And she said, oh, I'll get you a desk. And she said, look, why don't you come down? And of course, you go to a place at that time, King World, obviously looked after Oprah and all the rest of it. They had these cages in the basement on Wilshire Boulevard of, you know, like a new exec would come in and he would clear out the office and then have a new one. And this was just like this Aladdin's cave of, I mean, there was a lamb, there actually was a lamb, <laughs> which I didn't have to rub, thankfully, but every single thing was there. It was, and I was like, and she went, so just tell me what you want. 
And you know that, and again, that Scottish way of going, um, well, it, the, the, if I could have the desk, it should be like, yeah, well, have you got a chair? Oh, no, no, I can get a chair. No, 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 look, pick from all these chairs. And it went on and on like that. Till eventually I was thinking, oh my goodness me, I've just picked this and this and this and this. And then, and then she said, yeah, so where, where are you living? I'll, yeah, I'll just get it delivered. And I went, okay, well, let me know. I'll pay the, she went, no, 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 no. And again, with these big, huge companies, and I, maybe, I don't know if you find that now, you have you know, people, you know, budgets are so much more, uh, you know, strict. But it was like, yeah, it's fine. We'll get a van, we'll bring it. Blah, blah. And, and like, wow. so it's a thing, you know, when, when people help you out, it does, you remember it, you do. And, like, and, and I've experienced that as well, you know, British people here can be that, like, you know, well, I've got my community, I've got my group of friends, and we're good, so you sort of sort yourself out. And, yeah. and there's also the group that, you know, whatever nationality they are, but it might just be this town, but you can see them in their head thinking, what can this person do for me? And if they figure out pretty fast that you can't do anything for them, they maybe move on to the, to the <laughs> next. So I, I was fortunate that the group of friends that I found had all come to LA at the exact same time. You know, we were all at the exact same stage of life. We were all going through the same thing. So we had that immediate connection and that's what, that's what really helped me. But yeah, unfortunately, I'm sure it's the same as most cities around the world, but particularly here, there can be that element of, you know, sort of self-serving to the extent that they, they don't want to sort of include you and it can be tough. Yeah. Can I just jump on quickly, Gavin, you were talking about the football team and that, that's what I found as well here that was brilliant because at BAFTA, we, we would play cricket once a year. And and much as I like cricket and people who play cricket, but it was this weird thing. We'd play cricket once a year and we'd have that camaraderie on the day. And then three days later, I'd be at a BAFTA screening and I'd be like, hey, hi. And I was like, yes. And I go, yeah, Ross, remember yeah. stupid Scottish wicketkeeper? Oh, <laughs> yeah. And it was, I, it was such a disconnect. And so Julian uh, Stone at BAFTA, I said, Jules, why don't we just try and get some guys together and just go up the park and play football? And that's what we did. And then we created the BAFTA LA football yeah. team. And it was incredible that the, the camaraderie that came from that, but also what I absolutely loved about it was, and, you know, Daniel have seen this and you all have seen this at dinner parties, you know, people arrive and they go, this is so-and-so. And he says, da, da, la, 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 la. and it's almost like your resume is read out as you join the table. And at the football, it was great. And it was, I remember one of the first games, and my, my center hand was this brilliant player. And it was Pagey. And that was like, hi, Pagey, blah, blah. And at halftime, someone said, Martin. And I went, oh, and I was like, oh, sorry, Pagey? He went, oh, no, no, uh, Martin Page. I went, oh. And I went, are you a songwriter? And he went, yeah. And I went, wait a minute, you wrote, you built this city. You wrote, you know, <laughs> Faithful. You wrote, all these hits for growth, you, uh, uh, you know, and it was that lovely thing of, and then throughout the team, as weeks would go on, you would discover more, but it was just a case of, this is Sandy, this, you know, there's no, yeah. and he does this. And, and that was, a, I thought that was a lovely way of, of getting to know people. I must say, I must, I had my most Hollywood moment when I played it up for the bath, the team in five aside, just before I first joined, before I joined the other team. But anyway, we're playing five aside, and I got the I got I got the email saying we're going to play fives up in this house. I was like, all right, <laughs> rock up the house. Oh, it just happens to be Robbie Williams' house, and we're playing in his five aside football pitch in the back. I was like, oh, so I'm finally arrived in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, our, and our, our audience today is joining us from literally around the world. Oh, it was almost good. every continent. <laughs> Daniel didn't tell us his moment or person of opportunity yet. Oh, please. Oh, um, the casting coach is not <laughs> dead. Well, exactly. <laughs> no, no, Sorry, but I, Daniel. But actually, I think my experience was probably really different because I'd always worked internationally, always knew people here, had traveled here a number of times. So, for example, I knew a lot, I knew a lot of people here anyway. And, you know, one of my best mates who I'd known for, well, now known for 20 years, introduced me to Ross. So, you know, I got to know Ross because of a mate already. So I, I guess my experience wasn't, I felt like I was coming to a number of good friends already um, or people that I knew with through work already. So actually, I'd, 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 you know, I know, I know Ross King, everyone was fine. <laughs> yes, thank God for that. <laughs> Ross knows everyone. <laughs> 
Yeah. Now, but in all seriousness, we're, we're being joined um, by people around the world that are watching this presentation. And so just wanted to get your opinions and ideas about, we've touched on it a little bit throughout this conversation already, but just, you know, what makes the Scottish people so special? And, you know, I know we like to joke around about how, you know, the book, how the Scots invented the modern world, but it's very true that um, a lot of engineering innovation has come from Scotland um, and a lot of tenacity and ingenuity. And so Ross, what, what do you think, do you want to have anything to add to what makes the Scottish people so special? I think, and again, it's a big, broad, sweeping, overarching statement, but I think in the main that we're, we're pretty decent, loyal people. You know, that's what I always think. I think there definitely is, again, and it's, you know, not setting us completely aside from everyone else, but, you know, I think if there's a, there's a handshake between Scots, then it really does mean something. That's how I feel. Maybe that's a little bit of an antiquated uh, feeling or view, but I still think there's something that, you know, the Scots tend to say, if we say we're going to do something, we do something, I think. We're not into the, the, the bull, you know, what factor. And I think that's, I think that's also good. And I think we see, actually, that, I think that's probably a very important thing is I think we see through people really quickly. I think we can smell the you know what pretty quickly. And I think that's quite a nice, a nice uh, quality that we possess. Amazing. And so, Daniel... The, I mean, I think you have to live a way to almost look back into Scotland for its positive. Um, I don't think my, I mean, my, my experience of Scotland were not bad, but, it, you know, it was still grew up in the 70s and 80s. and It was kind of tough. And you bring that sort of tough street smart here and life's a lot easier. So I think Scottish people, are, I think they all have a, um, I think we have to look outward. We all look outward um, because it's actually better than, than possibly where we were brought up. I think we have an openness and I think we have a solidity and Scotland gives you a culture, it gives you an identity, it gives you a humanity. Um, politically just now, I think it's always, it's not been on the wrong side of history for a while. I think, I think the people, are, I think the Scotland and the people of Scotland have done a pretty decent job of steering a ship in, a, in, in the right direction on a number of things. You know, I mean, even just to give an example, if Scotland is the first country in the world to, to teach LGBTQI+, in school, that says quite a lot for the, the nation's wishes. And, and, I think, and I think, okay, we might be overshouting at times, um, but that, uh, that openness, I think that, that, I feel very proud of that now. And, and I think we're on the right side of stuff right now. Um, and I hope that continues. And I think Scotland is special. Scot the Scottish people are special, but it's also quite nice to be outside it and, and, and look back in. It, it's given us a very strong foundation. Um, and I think at all points, I think uh, the minute we all step our foot back into Turnhouse Airport or Glasgow Airport or Presswick or wherever you land, you go, ah, oh, I'm home. And we say it with such pride and strength. And it's that strength and that knowledge that we have. We, we're, we, we live in a, we, we're from a country that has dealt with a lot, is dealing with a lot and can live and deal with so much. Beautifully said. And Gavin, do you have anything to add? Any thoughts? I mean, I would agree with everything they say, you know, we, we touched on the, the tenacity, we touched on sort of like the, the street smarts, if you will, our ability to, to sort of carve through the BS and see true people. I think, you know, the fact that we are a small country, you know, we are exposed to all walks of life, you know, you know, we're not exactly sheltered, you know, as a CEO, I played football, so I was able to mix with people that I probably wouldn't mix with before, and I was always taught, which is something I hold on to dearly, always treat people with the same level of respect, regardless of their background, their level, their profession. And I seen, I think we we do that and we have that level of sort of self-deprecating humor as well that, that keeps us grounded. You know, when I go back to Glasgow, my friends that I've had since I was kids, they make sure that I keep my feet in the ground, like, you know, oh, you live in Hollywood now, but it means nothing to them. And that's what I think allows the Scots to flourish because we never get too ahead of ourselves, but we have that steely resolve and steely confidence that we're good at what we do. We make good contacts, we extend our network, and we bring a lot to the world, but we don't do it in an arrogant uh, way that would set us aside or, or move us away from, as I say, from building those strong relationships. I would have to agree. I think every Scot that I've met over here in this country and also in Scotland have been very approachable human beings and just very lovely and, and very willing to talk um, and seem very down to earth. And that's always very refreshing 
personally. And, um, and I wanted to just point out, you know, that Ian Wright on this panel today is also a fellow Scott Week board member. And Ian, we thank you so much for being here, all of you, but Ian for serving on our Scott Week board. And so maybe you can just end this, this question with your thoughts. Yeah, I, th I think when you think what makes, and I, I don't want to get too jingoistic or nationalistic because sometimes that can be a bit ugly as well, but I think you look at the things that we value in Scotland and certainly things like hospitality for all the people. Uh, we value education still. It's still something, education in Scotland is more or less free uh, right up to tertiary education. Um, a sense of fairness and treating people fairly and expecting to be treated fairly. Um, we're also very entrepreneurial. We're willing to take the chance. Uh, I think Ross said before, we're very adaptable as well. It makes us good travelers. Uh, we're, we're good people to have from another country if you're going to have someone. And having said all that, it may sound strange, but there's a, a strange mixture of humility and courage at the same time, uh, which I think is endearing. And I think for me, the, the two quotes that really sum up Scotland is what Voltaire said is, you know, we look to Scotland for all our ideas on civilization. And then J.M. Barry, when he said, there's few, so, few sites so impressive in this world as a Scotsman on the make. So I think when you combine those two things, it kind of sums up where we are. That's also beautifully said. You, you, all of you gentlemen have been so lovely today and we greatly appreciate all of your time and being here with us and talking with people around the world about your experiences um, and giving us your thoughts and ideas. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.